Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And uh, our guest tonight is Father Andrew Jones, former Baptist. When you, when you see him in a moment, you'll notice he doesn't look like a Baptist uh, because it's an, another part of his story that we'll talk about. Uh, but it's kind of special tonight because uh, Father Jones is, uh, happened to attend seminary with my son, Peter. So we might be here a little bit about it, but we're not here to talk about my son, Peter. We're here <laughs> to talk about Father Andrew Jones. Father Andrew, welcome to the Journey Home program. Thank you, Marcus. It's very good to be here. It is great to have you here. In fact, it's funny because you came here from Montgomery, Alabama, right? I did. Yeah, you flew over where we used to do this program, right? Right, well, that's actually, yeah, exactly, yeah. We flew <laughs> flew out of Birmingham because it was, yeah, exactly, so. Well, it's good to have you here. Yeah. It's good to have you here. Thank so you. let's. As I mentioned, we'll get to talking about why you're wearing this garb right. on this program. Right. So any of the Protestants watching, what these what? So we'll get to that later. But let's go way back and let's hear about your journey, if we would. Yeah, sure. Well, I I, I was born and raised in Norfolk, Virginia, um, and Baptist family both sides. <laughs> and uh, uh, my dad's side, a little bit, maybe you might call them more like the uh, the intentional Baptist side. Uh, my dad's a preacher's kid. He's the okay. youngest of six. Um, one of uh, one of his uh, sisters married a man who is a pastor also, and they were missionaries in Africa for 15 years. Um, another of his brothers is a pastor in Georgia. Um, I've got a cousin who's a church planner in Portland. Wow. And a, another cousin who's a pastor in uh, upstate New York. So that side is a little bit more Baptist than the other side. They're both Baptists, but one of them um, tries a little harder, I guess, <laughs> you might want to say. Well, you know, but, if, if I were to ask you to tell the folk this side of your family, pastors, missionaries, church planners, all that, what is there about their Baptist faith that makes them want to do all that? You know, I, I think it, it really starts with my granddad. You know, he, just, he passed away a couple years ago. He lived to be 92, I want to say. And uh, he just really was intentional and instilled in them um, a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. You know, and they prayed together and they prayed um, often and whenever we went to their home in North Carolina. So he retired when when, when I was born, you know, yeah. so I mean, that's the age spread, right? I mean, he was, wow. you know, and so we would always go to his house uh, for Thanksgiving, things like that. And um, it was always prayer. And we always say, you know, when Papa was going to pray, it's going to be like 30 minutes long. We're like, oh my gosh, can we just eat? But, you know, they're beautiful <laughs> prayers, but that's, he instilled that in that side yeah. of the family. And I really do, I want to, I would credit he and my, my grandma for being intentional about that. And in an appreciation for what God has done in their life, but also that person over there needs to know too. Yeah. I mean, that was their condition without Absolutely. Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you know, how else do you to raise a family to, like that, that, that full of ministers, people who heard the call? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, did, um, did that spark hit you as a young man? I guess, you know, I guess so. I mean, like growing up in, you know, in Virginia, um, you know, I was co cognizant of the fact that, you know, my granddad's a preacher and I have, you know, African missionaries and things like that. But, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, I never considered ministry of other than music ministry, possibly. So music was what, uh, when I was seven, my parents gave me piano lessons because I used to go to gr my grandma's house. Now this, this is the, the, the other side. Yeah. But uh, all my mom's family lives in the same neighborhood, and even to this day. So we would go over to, to her mom's house all the time and she had a piano and I would just bang on the thing. And they said, okay, you either need to stop banging on this or we're gonna get you lessons. So we got lessons, <laughs> which carried all the way through college, huh. right? And so, so I always thought, you know, well, if I was gonna do some sort of ministry, it'd probably be music ministry. Um, you know, but I would say that if anything other than that, um, the idea of being a missionary was always interesting to me too. Like I, I, I desperately wanted to go to Africa with my aunt and uncle, and that was just, that was just never going to happen, you know, because hmm. my parents are focusing on all the stories about like, oh, they almost got shot, or like, you know, <laughs> my cousin woke up and there was a scorpion in the bed. They're like, no son of mine is going to Africa. Okay, <laughs> okay fine, but you know, but that's right. that was an aspiration for a little while to be a missionary overseas. What, what about the conviction on Christ? Did that catch you? Did yes, that... um, very much so. And early on, I would say, I was, I was eight years old, and I remember, um, you know, when you're, when you're really little, um, we would do things like, you know, color during the preaching and like crawl under the pews and distract the old people. But eventually, <laughs> you get to the point where you start paying attention. And for me, that was around eight years old. Um, 
I don't remember who it was, but it was a revival, and you know the other Baptist watchers will know what those are. It's sort of like a parish mission, uh, if you're not from you. Know, so we had a revival in the summer. I don't remember who the guy was, but he came in and he was preaching like three or four nights. And we would sit up in the balcony. It was a horseshoe sanctuary, um, and we were up in the balcony. And I remember something just about what he was saying struck me, and it connected my little eight-year-old brain. He was talking about our need for being cleansed of sin. And I used to go to my friend's house all the time. He lived down the street and he had a pool in his backyard, which is great. Every kid wants a pool, right? And we didn't have one. The next best thing is to have a friend who has a pool. The only problem was their pool was in the backyard that was filled with oak trees. So it was like the nastiest pools, always filled with acorns, it's cold, like, you know, but it was still, it was a pool, right? So we'd go over there and his dad would say, oh great, you guys can clean the pool. And so you know, it was this Machiavellian little relationship where you like go hang out with your friend, but you had to work first, right? So we cleaned the pool out. So during the revival, I'm having this image in my head. My soul is like that swimming pool. It's filled with dirt and acorns and stuff. Mm. And Jesus needs to come in and scoop it all out, right? So that's what God used. Okay, great. So <laughs> I go, made the altar call and, uh, you know, gave, gave my heart to, to Jesus because I wanted my pool clean, my soul. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and that started, so I was about eight years old, and I remember that. Um, we tried to get my granddad to do the baptism, but he couldn't make it, um, so I was baptized a couple weeks later. In the Baptist church, for those that don't know, that's when you would be baptized, after you had had an awakening. Exactly. Then. Yeah. yeah, believer's baptism, we called it. Um, yeah, so they won't baptize you until you've made a decision for Christ. And as I say, it's, it's a public declaration of what you have already done in your heart, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So it's a couple weeks after the altar call, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, so that started off the journey. Uh, you and know. so now your dad's afraid you're going to go over to Africa and get caught with a scorpion. You know? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that ship sailed. Although, never say never, you know, you, never, <laughs> you, know, you don't know what God's going to do. But um, no, uh, a after that, um, my relationship with Jesus started really then. And I would say I've always had a, a questioning sort of mind, always a curious child, you know, maybe like sort of a philosopher's brain where you know like don't take things on face value I want to know why things are the way they are right so even early on I remember thinking things like okay um, if if uh, the Lord's Supper that we would do about once a month it's usually the first Sunday of the month in our church um, this is supposed to represent the body and blood of Christ that's broken for our sins right and so I remember as a, as a small child you know okay I have to really imagine that the saltine cracker is, is the body of Christ. And I, and I would, and I would try as, I would close my eyes, and I, was, I would crunch the cracker and think about how it's break, I'm breaking the body of Jesus with my sons, right? And when I would drink the, the Concord grape juice, uh, which was the best part, by the way, um, <laughs> <laughs> which started a lifelong addiction to Welch's grape juice, but anyway, <laughs> you'd drink it and you would think like, okay, like I have to imagine that this is the blood that was poured out for me. like. So even as a little kid, I'm like, oh, I'm trying to like, okay, like if this is a symbol, I really got to make this thing like a symbol. Like I got to try really hard, right? Um, and which, in that sense, you're you're following one expression of of the scriptures. Do this in remembrance of me. So you're working hard as a young. Yeah. This is the, you're trying to remember. You're trying to imagine. You're trying. That's good. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, that's, that's my part to play, right? I mean, Jesus gives us this thing. And so I have to sort of make it mean something. Right. <laughs> and, um, I mean, so that, but also other things too, you know, one thing, uh, growing up that I, I could never get a good answer on was, um, why does great grandma go to a different church? Hmm. Now she went to the Methodist church, which they did have a better vacation Bible school, I will say, but we didn't go there on Sundays. <laughs> and I would say, well, why? Why don't we go to the Methodist? Well, we're not, we're not Methodists, we're Baptists. Okay, I understand that, but why? I mean, what's the difference? Well, you know, there's not really, I mean, they, they believe kind of different things than we do. Well, they believe in Jesus. Yeah, okay, well, then why don't we all go to the same church? Well, I mean, because they're Methodists, you know, so it's a circular thing. Yeah. You can never really get a good answer about like, okay, well, I mean, is anyone else bothered by this? Like, why don't we all just go to the same church? Why are there so many different churches, you know? And so that always bothered me as a kid. And in fact, it got me in trouble sometimes in Sunday schools. And I remember when we lived in Roanoke, Virginia, up in the mountains for a couple of years, um, one of the deacons said, you know, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, well, shouldn't we all just want to be Christian? And he's like, you're, you're Baptist for a reason. 
And I was like, okay, but what are those reasons? You know, and, and that was the thing. They were, you know, so eventually we get to high school and uh, living back in Chesapeake, Virginia, in the Norfolk area, and we got a, a young pastor, probably my age now, in his 30s, and he decided he was going to start things off with a sermon series on what Baptists believe. And I said, this is great, this is what I've been waiting for. Because <laughs> I got some questions, maybe this guy has some answers, right? So the first one, he preaches about baptism from the baptistry, right? But then he preaches about uh, the Lord's Supper, and that was an interesting one. Because I remember he said, okay, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, this is a little bit of an aside, but you know, now that I'm a priest, I can kind of appreciate this a little bit more. Of course, in the Baptist tradition, you don't have a lectionary cycle. Right. Right. So it's whatever the spirit puts on the heart of the preacher, where, of course, now as a Catholic, like sometimes I'm forced to preach on things that I just don't know how to talk about or I'm uncomfortable with it. Right. You know, so I just I noticed even back then that the Holy Spirit really favored certain books like he really liked Exodus and Romans. <laughs> right. But you hardly heard anything else. Right. So when he's like open to First Corinthians 11, we're like, OK, this is the first time many of us are hearing this. Right. Right. And he proceeds to read the passage about how you need to discern the body and blood of the Lord and, and so eat and drink in a worthy manner. And be, if you don't do that, uh, some of you are sick and some of you have died, right? And so the pastor says, now, we're not Catholics. We don't believe that the Lord's Supper is Jesus. But clearly the Bible is telling us that you have to take this seriously or else the consequences could be dire. And I remember after that, almost nobody received communion anymore. Like, every, they would just pass it. Nobody was like, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy this week. You know, and I just remember thinking, like, this is the weirdest thing ever. Interesting. And it stayed with me, because, you know, I, could, I couldn't, I, that was a hard thing for me to square, because, as I told you, I had already been trying to make it mean something and, and to really imagine, right? But it seemed like there's this new piece now where there's a consequence if you don't do it correctly. But what does that mean? And our guest is Father Andrew Jones. Yeah, you've opened up a can of worms. We're going to have to put this program aside for a second because I want to talk to you. No, because, <laughs> yeah. because it's interesting. Why would the, peop the people would, taking 1 Corinthians 11 seriously, might say that, but it's like, but what about the rest of the Baptist faith that talks about salvation and, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. There's another piece of that puzzle right. that... It was a great opportune time for him to, to tell them why they were worthy to receive it because of what Christ did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, but it's, that, that kind of kind of points to the fact that these people sitting in the pew really heard that sermon. But there's the danger if, you, if your otherwise formation isn't strong enough. You're only going to hear one part of the puzzle. Right. And they're not receiving it anymore. Very interesting. No, no. It was, anyway, it was super mean? interesting because I remember, you know, because we, we would, every Baptist church is different. I know that, yeah. you know, but ours was special occasions and first Sundays of the month you would have communion. And I remember for years after that, certain people would, would pass it because they didn't feel worthy, you know. And I just, I thought that was interesting. Like, yes. well, you know, there's sin on my heart or whatever. Like, okay, well. Um, and there's no confession. <laughs> what do you do about that, right? Yeah, exactly. There's no confession, but uh, but there you go. You know, so I, you know, I thought that was interesting. But what I thought was very interesting also was that uh, that that God's consequence was so harsh. I'm like, man, I could die. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty bad. Yeah. You know, um, but that. Well, it's also interesting that they they focused on of that passage. They focused on their unworthiness. That's what he's. Paul's talking about, but did they focus on the fact that, wait a second, if this is only a symbol, then how can that do that? Right. Well, that, that, that's what stuck out to me. Yeah. Because I said, well, you know, if, maybe if I could phrase it this way, it seems to me that if something is a symbol, the onus of making the symbol mean something is on the person who's interacting with the symbol, right? In other words, if I receive saltine crackers and grape juice, and it's going to mean something to me, I'm the one who has to make it mean something, right? So, and that, which was what I was trying to do. But if I'm going to be punished for doing it incorrectly, that's a steep punishment. What it, what it came down to me in, my, in, in, in the way that I expressed it at the time was, 
So what you're saying is God will punish people for having bad imaginations. <laughs> Yeah, because it stays. It's still a saltine cracker. It's, 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 it's exactly. It's a symbol. So if you don't imagine it the right way, because that's all there is, is for you to connect the dots, yeah. then but, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And that to me was like, I, I can't believe in that kind of a god. Like that just sounds harsh. <laughs> like that can't be what it means. But you don't have. There's no other framework to. to yeah. just, I don't know what to do with that. So there's just something that got shelved in high school. Um, yeah. Especially because the pastor began with, we're not Catholics. Right. Well, well whatever that meant. I didn't know any Catholics right. anyway. But in other yeah. words, we're not, this isn't the body, this isn't really the body. Right. So that, that category was immediately eliminated. So what's left? Imagination is yeah. all that's left. Yeah. Okay. For, for me to connect the dots that Jesus has given me. Okay. Right. All right. Um, so, so that got shelved as like, I, does not compute. Don't know what to do with this. Right. Um, but then there was also this, this uh, uh, later in high school, I, I would help out at, uh, at a camp called Camp Hope Haven, which was in Virginia Beach, it was um, underprivileged children who would come out to the, the country and uh, have a week of camp. So I was a counselor out there. So it's a Christian camp, you know, and, um, and of course, you know, you're hoping that kids get saved. The problem was the kids that came every year would get saved every year. And then you would have to explain to them <laughs> that you only get saved once, right? And uh, and, and, and that sort of stuck with me too, because I was like, you know, there's, there's some disconnect here. Because they would start going to confession. Now, I wouldn't have called it that then, right. but as a counselor, but okay, well, why are you coming down the aisle? Well, because I hit my brother, or I did this, or I lied to my mom, or whatever. Okay, well, those are just sins that, I mean, Jesus forgave past, present, and future sins. Like, you don't have to come down the aisle again. Like, that's already forgiven. But they had a real need to get that off their chest. Hmm. And that was another thing that had to be shelved because I was like, I don't know what to do with that. Hmm. Normally what people would do is they'd come down and say like, I backslid and like, you know, I want to rededicate my life to Christ or something like that. But these are, these are children who recognize a need for confession, a human need to be forgiven. Hmm. And they haven't learned to be able to explain it away to themselves yet to say like, okay, well I prayed and God forgave me. Like they want to hmm. know that they were forgiven. And the only way to do that is to have it publicly acknowledged, right? That, that's that was interesting. Yeah. So that was another thing that had to be shelved because I didn't have a category for that. <laughs> right. So I'm like, okay. So I'm I'm trying my best. It comes time to uh, to go to college. We're gonna pick a college, right? So so okay. Jesus, you tell me what college to go to because I don't I want to go the one you want me to go to. Um, I had commissioned a a Baptist hymn uh, to. Uh, for my senior piano recital, which was the motto for going out of high school. And, and some of our Baptist listeners may know it. It's called, uh, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. And I said, this, that's, that's my attitude going into college. Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. I want to go to the college God wants me to go to. And I had heard the statistic that most uh, freshmen, by the time they graduate, 80% uh, don't practice their faith anymore. And I didn't want that to be me in college. Hmm. So I was like, I'm gonna to have to be intentional. I wanna go where God wants me to go. So I'm praying, praying this, this prayer and um, all the right doors open for me to go to George Mason University outside of DC in Fairfax. And so I go up there and before, before I get to go there, my, my friend calls me who I grew up with and uh, he says, hey, um, my, my parents, you know, we go visit our, our dad's side of the family over in Greece every, every couple of years. Do you wanna go with us? This is 2004. I'm like, who doesn't want to go to Greece? Of course I want to go with you to Greece, right? And he said, okay, we well just save up your money, pay your way, and you can go with us. And so the summer before I go to college, I get to go to Greece for like a month because wow. this is like a family trip. And they said, oh, by the way, we're going to take a vacation while we're there to Italy. So I'm like, well, this is great because I get to go on two vacations. <laughs> right? so, this, and so this is formative for me because this is the first time I'm outside of uh, – North America. And, you know, when you're in Athens and you're, I mean, there, there, are, there are churches there in Athens where you can stand in that, that are from the time of Constantine. <laughs> and again, talk about things that are shelled that you don't have categories for. I'm like, okay, my, my church I thought was old in Virginia and that thing is from like 1890 and this thing is 300 <laughs> something AD. Like, it, and it doesn't look anything like my church because it's full of icons. And, uh, and every church we seem to go to in all these little islands, there's always a little old nun who's gesturing to you to come like kiss a, a dead person who's in a box. 
you know, where it's like the foot of a dead person or something. And they're like, come, come, kiss this thing. And I'm like, no, thank you. You know, <laughs> like this is very strange. And yet this is Christianity and it's far older than my version. And thank God it's not my version, but how did we get from there to here? Because something happened. And all I knew was that, you know, what we had been told in Sunday school was, you know, kind of the rote Protestant thing of like, Gutenberg invented a printing press, people read the Bible and left the Catholic Church, right? I'm like, okay, but that's a little simplistic. It couldn't, it, it, there's gotta be more to it than that. You know, cause here I am, you're 18, you're in Greece, you're in Italy, you're in the Vatican, right? I had to argue with my, my friend's dad to go to the Vatican because he, he's like, oh, we're not Catholic, we're gonna go there. And I was like, it's okay, Michelangelo, you don't wanna see Michelangelo? Like, okay, I guess we can go, you know? So we're like in the Vatican, you see like John the Third and you know, and he's incorrupt. And it was like, well, he sure looks like he's still got some girth on him, you know, that's a big man, you know, and he's been dead for a while. And you're like, well, this is, this is weird, this is interesting. Um, this is Christianity, but not my version of Christianity. <laughs> And, uh, and I don't know what to do with those, you know. But I had a sense, I was like, this is far older than my tradition. And so I, I in, in, out of respect for it, I need, I need to be able to understand how we got to where we got. This is part of our history, and I'm glad it's not my current reality, but I don't know anything about this. And this is so, so, so different. So when I, when I got back to, um, the U.S. I had bought tons of icons in Greece because I mean you, you know they're like ten euro a pop you know and you're like this is great you know these things I, I had this fascination with icons but I don't know what they were and it sort of reminds me of uh, the Flannery O'Connor story I don't know if you like Flannery O'Connor but she has a, a story called Parker's Back which is um, you know, kind of a play on the meanings of the word Parker's Back the sentence but you know it's about a man who um, wants to tattoo his whole body. And then the, the last place that he has reserved is his back. And he wants to get an icon of Jesus on his back because it just sticks out to him. And he doesn't, he can't explain why. <laughs> and it's sort of like that, I bought like 10 icons and I couldn't, I couldn't tell you why. They're just like, I don't know, there's something about these things. And so I was giving them out to people and they're like, thank you. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. They're all in closets somewhere now, probably. <laughs> you know, but I was like, I need to, I need to know about Christian history. I'm just so ignorant about Christian history. And I'm getting a music and a history degree, so let me use that. Um, I'm in DC, right? I, I can, there's places I can go to figure this out. And so, uh, as a freshman um, in my Western Civ class, you had to do a, a project on museums, and so I picked icons. That was a topic you could pick. And I was like, this is great, because I want to know what these things are. I said, well, you can either go uh, to this icon museum, or you can go to the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. The icon museum was closed for renovations for a year. Couldn't go there. So, so I guess I'll go to this National Shrine, whatever that thing is. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna take two friends with me because there is no way I'm going there by myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> right, it's dangerous, right. So we, so we go out there, you know, take the subway out to the National Shrine, and you walk in this place, you're like, man, this thing is huge. And, uh, and everything is dedicated to Mary. And that's a little strange. Where's Jesus? Oh, there he is in the back. And he looks really mean. <laughs> like, where am I? <laughs> Do we worship Jesus or are we afraid of Jesus? I'm not really sure. This, you know. And so we're, you know, we're taking a little tour. And, go, and the tour's great, by the way. So I had this little four foot tall Haitian woman who was our tour guide. <laughs> and we get to the, the Pius X chapel and she says, this is, this is the chapel of Pius X. He's known as, of course, as the Pope of the Eucharist. And I said, I mean, of course, I've never heard that word before. So I raised my hand and I said, what, excuse me. She said, yes. I said, what, what is the, what is the Eucharist? What is that? And, you know, and then everybody's like, <laughs> what is this guy on the store? <laughs> sure. So I don't remember what happened after the tour because I was so embarrassed because I was like, obviously this is important. And I just kind of blew my cover, I guess, or something. So I went to Barnes and Noble and I said, I have to find out what the Eucharist is. And, um, and I, so I was just like, well, I'll go to the religion section. I'm sure they have a book on it somewhere. And, and I just pulled out the first book that I could find on it. Um, they only had one, as I remember, that, that mentioned Eucharist. And uh, it was a book called The Lamb's Supper. <laughs> and, and I read it in Barnes & Noble because I wasn't going to buy it because it's a Catholic book. So I'm not going to give money to the Catholic Church, but I'll read it. This is back when Barnes & Noble let you read in the play, you know, now they discourage that. They used to have, you know, little chairs right. or whatever. So I just read the whole thing in there and put it back on the shelf. And I said, you know, that was very interesting. 
So the next week I went back and I said, let me read some more about this kind of stuff. So I read a book called Hail Holy Queen, which was next to the other one. <laughs> and I was like, you know, this is very interesting. It's starting to connect some dots of these questions that I had shelved back in high school. You know, does it make more sense for the penalty of unworthy reception of communion to be so harsh if it really is Jesus himself? Just like in, in the Old Testament where, you know, if, if, you, if you touch or look at God or you do something to God himself, the penalty is usually death. And if the penalty is going to be death in this case, might it not be in the same category? Does the penalty not tell you what, what the thing is that you violated, right? But now, now this is a little frightening because now you're in Catholic territory and you're not supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? And I didn't know any Catholics up until this point, um, except for one from high school. And so he's the only person I knew to, to ask any questions to. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm talking to her and I said, I, you know, I don't know what, what to do about this. So she said, well, let me give you a catechism. And I said, well, what is a catechism? She said, it, it'll answer your questions so you don't have to do this detective work anymore. I said, okay. <laughs> so she gave me a, a catechism and a rosary. And I said, okay, well, the rosary's going in a drawer, but I'll read the catechism, right? I'm reading through the catechism, like, okay, so I would go catechism, and then I would go online and say, like, you know, Martin Luther, Protestant response to whatever the category was, and then read both of them. And uh, I was like, man, the Catholic, this Cat the Catholic Church, it, it's, there's a richness and a depth to the answers that they're giving. They're satisfying answers, so they're obviously from Satan. <laughs> <laughs> right, because it can't. They're, they're too, too appealing. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, and I'm like, and I know my Bible. I'm a little, I'm a little Baptist, so it's like, I know Hebrews says that Satan can pray as, a, as an angel of light. So how do I know this is not Satan? <laughs> it probably is, right? And. Uh, you know, I'm going to pause there. That's cool. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll, we'll leave the cliffhanger there that you, you discovered because <laughs> it's right. time for a break, but you've. You've dipped your toe into the um, the land you're not supposed to go into, which was the shrine into Catholicism, mm -hmm. the Catholic bookstore. You read the stuff, and then you wonder, wait a second, is this of the devil? Mm -hmm. Is that what it, cause it could be? Um, and I, the reason I wanted to pause there, because I know a lot of old buddies that they still think that. Mm -hmm. it, yep. You know, it, it, especially if it's too, if it's too, too good, it's got to be of the devil, you know. So, so let's pause there. And... Uh, I do want to remind the audience before we take our break that of our website, chnetwork.org. It's the website of the Coming Home Network International, where if you go to that, you'll find not only more stories like Father Andrews, but you're going to find lots of other ways to help you work through some of these issues that Father Andrew was talking about. So we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and my guest is Father Andrew Jones. And uh, I've rudely interrupted him in the middle of his journey, uh, <laughs> but left you hanging. Uh, episode one, you, you, you wondered whether this is all the devil and whether you're being tempted. So yeah. how'd you get off that cliff? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a hard cliff to get off of, right? Um, how do you know? And I, that's, I think that's, you know, that's a good question for people. Um, because you need to make sure. <laughs> the Bible's pretty, pretty yeah. explicit about that. That, that um, for me, I said, you know, I don't trust myself. I can't. Yeah. I can't trust myself. I don't even know why I do half the time. And Paul says that, right? <laughs> uh, the most relatable part of the Bible. <laughs> I don't do what I want. What I want to do is not what I should do, right? Why do I do it? I don't know. You know I, I'm right there with you, Paul, right? Yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to have to pray myself through this one, right? Again, wherever he leads, I'll go, right? So Jesus, like, if, if, if this is, like, of the devil, then, like, take this. If it's not, then, you know, wherever you, wherever you lead, I'll go, right? I'm open to what you want me to do. Yeah. This just seems like probably not what you want me to do, but, you know, it's yeah. in your hands, you know? 
And it is a tough journey for, I know some of our guests have come from traditions where they're so drained, drilled into their mind that the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon. And so when they, if we're drawn to it, it's, it's yeah. a, a, some baggage, it's hard to let go of. When, right. When, when you and you know, and that. the thing is, I didn't have any of that in my background other than like every now and then in a sermon, somebody would be like, and we're not Catholic. Yeah. But that didn't, mean, that didn't mean anything to me because I don't know any Catholics. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, whatever, whatever that means, you know. So it's, you know, we just didn't talk about Catholics because we didn't live in a Catholic yeah. neighborhood. You know, we didn't interact with them. I had like maybe a couple in school. But it must be bad though. You know, we don't go yeah, there. Yeah, well they're not, we are they what Christian? it is. I mean, <laughs> I remember, you know, growing up we would have little debates like, are Catholics Christians? You know, and I think me and my friends ended up saying that like maybe, but it's probably difficult, you know, but it's like, what do you know as a 17 year old? I've never even been to a Catholic church. Like, you know, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna decide whether a whole group of people is like in or out, you know? So, so anyway, so I'm praying, I'm saying like, all right, God, like this, this is in your hands. Um, but the thing was, along the way, I'm meeting, like I'm on Campus Crusade for Christ retreats, you know, out in Maryland, I mean, it's beautiful, like in the mountains, and I'm meeting other guys that are going through the same thing, right? Oh, uh, I read this book on this thing, and oh, well, I was worried about Mary too, and there's people debating, like, Marian devotion <laughs> late at night, you know, and, and I'm like, what? Well, that's interesting. I just read a book on that, you know, and so we're telling well, what does the Bible say about this, you know? And I... Every time we would get in, in these debates or these discussions, it's like I always ended up being on the Catholic side inadvertently because it, that's where, what I saw in the scriptures, right? Um, so whether it was Marian devotion or whether it was, uh, you know, the Eucharist or whether it was um, like purgatory. You know, purgatory for me, I, I had a, grown up on a steady diet of C.S. Lewis and so purgatory for me was not a big deal. Yeah. You know, his, his argument that, you know, if you went to heaven and you were dressed in dirty rags, wouldn't you want to wash up first? Just always made sense to me. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. I, I absolutely would like to wash up first, right? <laughs> and, and sort of the argument of like, okay, well, what's being saved here? Like, are you being saved or is just your life, your existence being saved? You know, and that to me is an interesting question. When I stand in heaven before God, does God look at me? Or does he look at Jesus and pretend that he's looking at me? <laughs> because that's the theology that's out there that, that I grew yeah, up with. Right. And I said, you know, what would heaven be like if it's essentially, I'm so angry I can't look at you from God forever? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. That sounds like hell to me, you know? And, and so I'm encountering like already, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is almost like the Holy Spirit was like prepping me <laughs> so that when I encounter Catholic doctrine, these are already things I wrestled with. Mm -hmm. So the conversion came really fast. You know, with like within that first year I'm in some, or well, I'm, I'm in college, I'm like, I have to be Catholic, you know? I'm just like, what, why? You weren't, you weren't even thinking, you weren't even talking, you didn't know who Catholics were a year ago. Like, were you brainwashed? Like, that was the thing for my, for my family, a lot of them, that was the word that was thrown out, like brainwashed, you know? It's like, almost like you're brainwashed. And I'm like, I, I just don't, it's like, you, you're just not privy to all of these conundrums that have been in my head for years. Mm -hmm that are suddenly being answered, you know, and, and they make scriptural sense. And not only that, they, they make sense in, in the apostolicity and the history of the church. Um, I'm discovering that there were Christians after the Bible <laughs> and they wrote a lot <laughs> and the things that they wrote are very Catholic. You know, and, and this went back to my earlier quandary as a child, like why can't we all just be a part of the same church? Well. What I decided was my solution would be, was find the people who knew the apostles. What did they believe? Because they don't have time to be corrupted yet. So Constantine, we'd always heard, ruined everything. It's always his fault, you know, which is the great irony of history because Constantine's the one who gives us homoousius, right? Mm -hmm. Like the fact that we believe in the hypostatic union is a singular grace given to the Emperor Constantine by the Holy Spirit. It's like, that's why he's the one who settled that debate. Anyway, whatever. So he ruined the whole church in, in, the, in the Baptist narrative, right? So if you find people before Constantine, after the Bible, and that's the, yeah. that's the golden sweet spot, right? The era of house churches where everything was perfect and there weren't any denominational divisions. Well, guess what? Those people are talking about bishops and sacraments, and they're talking about uh, very Catholic things. And, and so this is uh, eventually that and the saints themselves. So this is the thing, we, 
in the Baptist Church, you, you, you don't have saints or a veneration of saints, but there are people that you talk about um, as exemplary people, but there are very few of them, like Lottie Moon. Always have a Christmas offering for Lottie Moon. Most people couldn't tell you what Lottie Moon did, but we know that Lottie Moon was important and a good Baptist Christian, and we give money to places in her name at Christmas, right? So that's the extent of like maybe a veneration of saints in the Baptist Church. <laughs> when you have like, you know, St. Augustine and like, you know, St. Anselm and all these people that the Catholics are claiming, and you're like, well, I've heard of Augustine. <laughs> so apparently I've been saying his name wrong and he's a saint, right? Okay, we'll just say. So you, you look at what they're saying, and it's like, okay, well, these people, not only are they affirming the things that are attractive to me about Catholicism that are answering big questions that I've always had, but they lived it. Hmm. And that's what's attractive. And I said, you know, if, if all you had was the catechism and the teachings of the church, I don't know that you could get out of the Satan conundrum. But because you have people who lived it and became yeah. holy, the proof in the pudding is the saints of the church, hmm. right? So it's like, how do you know that this isn't from Satan? Because Satan doesn't make saints, hmm. right? So you have St. Francis of Assisi, Mother Teresa, John Paul II, who, whatever saint you want to pick. Why, as Jesus himself says, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Why would, what would Satan gain by, by making a Francis of Assisi? <laughs> yeah, or like an early, uh, martyr like yeah, Polycarp, right? Who was willing to die for but, Jesus, right? <laughs> but are super Catholic, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and so that's the thing. It's like you know, Francis of Assisi, far from being like the hippie who lives in the woods, is somebody who's like devoted to the Eucharist and and adoration and you know you know nativity scenes and all the all these kind of very Catholic things and like submission to the Pope and things like that. Um, so you're kind of left with the question, like, did these people become holy in spite of their Catholicism? Or did their Catholicism become the instrument that led to their transformation into another Christ? And that for me was, was the answer. It's like, okay, I have to be Catholic because if I want to be Christian in the true sense of the word as a little Christ, what it literally means, um, I can't do that without him doing it. And if you're telling me that I can receive his essence, then it just, duh, right? Yeah. Well, what about, you know, Marian devotion? I'll, we'll figure that out later. You know, like if it, it's not, it's not as, like if I can, if I can receive God himself and then he can in, within me transform me into a saint, um, I trust him on the rest of the stuff. You know, the, the authority of the church you know, as, as we've mentioned many times in this program and in many books, is, you know, the, the church has an authority set up for Christ. And, I, and, and there's a genius in that. It's a, this is the same God we're talking about who the Gospel of John says, did not need anyone to teach him about the human heart, <laughs> right? <laughs> like he knows it very well himself. And so he sets up structures for a reason. Why is there confession? Because little boys who are eight years old at Camp Hope Haven need to go to confession. <laughs> Right? The human heart needs to confess and, and to hear that they're forgiven. Um, you see that there's, there's like a, there's a mystical and a, a, a practical reality to all these things that he sets up. Like, why is there a magisterium? Because if you have the same Bible and I have the same Bible and we argue, we're probably not ever gonna agree on anything. And so whose fault is that? Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will lead you all to truth. So how do we end up with so many disagreements? Oh. Well, whose Holy Spirit is right? And, you know, well, whose Bible is right for that matter, right? That's right. You go to a bookstore <laughs> and there's a mess of translations. You know what I mean? So, our so, guest is Father Andrew Jones. I was also thinking of the image that you had earlier about the Eucharist when you have the saltine in this little shot glass of, of Welch's grape juice, and you feel that it's up to you to imagine somehow. Right. And but it also but but when you go back to those earliest apostolic fathers, I don't remember which one made the quote, but long before transubstantiation, you have them saying, "This is the body and blood of Christ." Don't trust your senses. Right. It is. It is, and you know, it's. People ask me, "Well, why did you become Catholic ultimately?" And I would say, "It's the sacraments. Sacramental theology 
is incredibly beautiful, profound. The, the deeper you dive into it, the more beautiful it gets, which I think is proof of its <laughs> divine origin, right? But on the surface, it's like, what's going on here? While the onus of making this mean something has been taken out of my hands and put in the hands of the one who, who can, right? The Eucharist means something because God makes it. Hmm. Now, that's profound because that means, you know, if, if I have a head injury and I'm in a hospital room, I can receive viaticum and it's okay that I can't put two and two together because God does it, <laughs> right? Now, all the sacraments are like that. It, it's putting God in the proper place. God is the one who makes this thing efficacious, not me. I can add to the benefit of that in, in my understanding, but it's not necessary. There's room in the Catholic Church for somebody with a head injury to receive communion and, and, and to not be unworthy, but there's not room in the previous tradition I came from. Yeah, if you don't understand. If you don't understand, it doesn't mean anything. All right, Father John, because of time, you've, you've come into the church, all right? Right? You've come into the church. 2005, the church. December 1st. 2005, December 1st. Got a speeding ticket into the church. Thursday night. Okay. Um, <laughs> you were so excited. I was and so excited. You were so excited. So you, but you come from a long line of Baptists who think you flipped. Yeah. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I'm just saying that because... On the other hand, you ended up wearing this scarf. Yeah. How'd you get from there to here? Yeah, the Roman collar. Um, so pretty soon after I became uh, a member of the Catholic Church in 2005, um, I had a, an attraction to priesthood. But I just chalked it up to, well, you're a new Catholic and so everything's nice and shiny, right? Um, but somebody said, you should talk to the uh, vocation director here in Arlington, so I did. And I remember the vocation director at the time, he said, well, why do you think you're called to be a priest? I was like, I don't know if I'm called to be a priest. <laughs> I'm just, you know, it's interesting to me, it's attractive to me. And he said, okay, well, what you need to pay attention to is if you have a desire to administer sacraments. Because that's what a priest can do that you can't do. He's like, preaching, if you have a desire to preach, not necessarily part of being a priest. Teaching, same thing. But if you have a draw to a sacrament that you, that you desire, it's to pay attention to that and the years come in going forward. Uh, so, so after college, I was a focus missionary for a little while, um, for about four years, and, uh, which is how I got to my current diocese. So I, I was sent to Auburn University as a focus missionary, which is in the Archdiocese of Mobile. I was there for three years. I spent a year in Florida. Um, and during that time, you know, uh, dated, you know, tried to discern marriage, things like that. Um, but there was, I remember this very, there was, there was a retreat that we did at the uh, at Mother Angelica Shrine, the most blessed sacrament in Hansville, which everyone should go to. No. You have to go there. I mean, you'll think you're in Italy uh, instead of <laughs> Hansville. <laughs> but we're doing a retreat there, and we were doing, uh, during adoration in a chapel, we had prayer teams that were praying with, it was all missionaries who so we were praying with other missionaries. And I remember uh, praying with this other missionary, and in that moment, looking at the sacrament, as she's pouring her heart out about these things and these troubles in her life. And I thought, I wish I could hear her confession. Hmm. And then I thought back to that vocation director and I was like, you know, that's interesting. Um, I had a desire to, to give her sacramental absolution, but I, I, but I couldn't, you know. But there, were, there was a desire to do that. And confession always, you know, every priest has a sacrament I think they're drawn to. For me, it's always been confession. Um, and that's not to say I, I don't want to celebrate Mass so much, you know, but the one that has always drawn my heart is the healing that comes through the sacrament of confession. Um, so that, that, was, that was a little tug, right? Hmm. Uh, but it wasn't until a um, uh, uh, spiritual director I had, old Jesuit, had been a missionary in, Je in Japan, you know, uh, down in Tampa, and he said, you know, well, St. Ignatius says when you're in a time of tranquility, that you just make a decision. So what do you want to do? And I was like, what do you mean, what do, what do I want to do? He said, well, what, what would you pick? And I said, what do you mean, just pick one? And I said, I want to do what God wants me. He said, I know you want to do what God, that's why you're here. But what would you want to do if you could pick one? 
And I said, I guess priesthood. And he's like, okay, well, you made your choice. I was like, no, no, I didn't make a choice. I'm like, is this how you get people in? You like trick them like this? This is bad. He's like, no, 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 no. He's like, go, go, into, go into the chapel and just pray for a, a time about being a priest. And then just write down what moves your heart, what kind of priest, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I, I did that and, and it was all this uh, effusive emotions just came. I was like, like, I allowed myself to be excited about the possibility. And, and I was surprised at, at how much it moved me. And he was too, quite frankly, because he said, okay, well, I was about to tell you to go back and do the same thing for marriage, but I think we might have hit something. And I was like, okay, well, what, what does that mean? He said, like, well, you tell me what it means. He's a great spiritual director, right? They, <laughs> so I was like, I don't know, I guess I, you know, so I start thinking about seminaries. And of course, then you have to figure out where you're going to go. Because I always tell people, it's like, it's like baseball. You can't be a free agent. You have to belong to a team. Right, right, <laughs> right. right, right. Um, so do I go back to Virginia? I have no Catholic roots there. I haven't lived there in years. Um, do I stay here in Orlando? That's an easy no. I hated Orlando. <laughs> um, do I go to the Jesuits? Because there's that missionary call that's always been there. Um, or Archdiocese of Mobile. I tried the Jesuits. Um, and again, the prayer has always been the same. Wherever you lead, I, I go. And the doors just all shut. Hmm. And really, inex we don't have time to talk about it, but the weirdest, you, like inexplicably, <laughs> like being told things on the phone that you, it just doesn't make any sense. So like, okay, well clearly I'm not supposed to go to the Jesuits. So I called uh, Mobile, and uh, I said, I'm living in Florida, I think I'm called to the priesthood, and um, I, I wanna give it a couple years because I'm not sure. And they said, well, that's why you go to seminary. <laughs> you know, so we had the interview and, and ended up going to seminary, and every year in seminary was like that. Like, okay, I'll stay another year if this is what you want. And eventually you have to get to the point where they talk about seminary where this has to become a yes to something that you agree to do, right? You have to make a decision, right? And uh, when I got to about second theology, I said, you know what? I want to be a priest. It's not just like, if, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. I want to do it too. Mm -hmm. And I think it, every vocation has to have that moment, right? God is not coercing you into things, right? Like, right. like right. it's something that, that you're responding to that, that if it's the, the vocation that God has called you to, it's something that, that enlivens your heart. And so you, it's something that you want too, really. And you get to that point where I, and I said, yes, I want to be a priest. And so I was ordained in 2018 for the Archdiocese of Mobile. I'm the pastor of St. Jude uh, Parish in Montgomery, a historic black Catholic church uh, there in West Montgomery. And uh, my family has no, they don't understand <laughs> what all these, and first you're a Catholic, <laughs> then you're a missionary, now you're a priest, like, you know. Um, but. Uh, you know, that's that's where I am, and uh, you know, who knows what will happen with the rest of the family. I mean, that's I think that's up to him. No, you would have only been at that parish for a short time. Right? I've only been pastor of, of St. Jude for since uh, June. Okay. So I just got there. Maybe talk just a moment about that experience, because you, you see that's a historically black Catholic it is. church. It's a beautiful place. Um, it's And when I say it's a unique parish, I mean that in the literal sense of the word. like. Father Harold Purcell is the founding pastor. He was a passionist priest who came down from Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, Bishop Tulin of uh, Mobile, Birmingham at the time was the only pastor who he had written to many in the South. He said, I want to serve uh, the African-American community in the South. This is 1930s, this is the height of yeah. Jim Crow, right? Yeah. And uh, Tulin said, come to my diocese. So he came down to Montgomery, they bought 60 acres. Um, and they start, so he calls it City of St. Jude because it, it was going to serve the needs, like African Americans don't have a hospital in Montgomery in the 30s, so he built one, St. Jude Hospital. They didn't have a, a good school, so he built one, St. Jude Educational Institute. Um, he built a printing press, he built a home for children. I mean, it's, it's a city, you know, and the way he laid it out, he put the parish right in the middle of the campus because, and it's higher up, it's, it's two stories, so the church is on the second floor. And the point is, when you come here, it's like, this is why we're here. This is the center of the thing. Everything is literally revolves around this. Um, and this is for you. I named it, he says, I named it St. Jude because I want people to know that no one is hopeless. No one is hopeless. Praise God. Um, so his motto was not what you have, but you. That's what we're interested in, you, mm -hmm. right? And so whatever you need, you come here, right? And so St. Jude uh, lived that and you get into, uh, into the 60s, 1964, they have the Selma to Montgomery March. Yeah. Uh, they're looking for a place for the fourth campsite bef the night before they get to the capital in Montgomery. 
and they end up using St. Jude. And the parishioners who've been there for a long time will tell you they suffered a lot for allowing that. A lot of the funding dried up. We have copies of letters that people sent in the 60s that said, uh, you know, the Catholic Church should not be getting involved in politics and on racial issues. Yeah. We're, we're ca- take me Purcell off. There's at the, at that he time? died in 1952. Okay. So this is, yeah, so, but people pulled their funding out, people pulled their kids out of the school, things like that. You know, but uh, it's played a big role, not only in the African American community in Montgomery, but, but also for the nation, for voting rights. I mean, that, that was a big, they, they took a big step out and took a lot of criticisms for that. But uh, you have to go to this, I mean, really, you have to see, like, Father Purcell hired um, African American workers, African American contractors, African American architects. He wanted everything to have been done by that community. And it's a teaching church. On, on the roof is, uh, in the ceiling in the nave is the Ten Commandments. All the windows on this side, every window is a piece of the, the Apostles' Creed with an explan- explanation from the Bible of why we say that. All the windows on this side are all the sacraments with biblical explanations of why we believe that. Over all the confessionals are verses about why you should confess your sins, right? Um, like everything in the church is wow. geared to, wow. you walk in here not knowing anything about Catholicism and then you can understand it. It's, it's, I've never seen a place like that. It's a beautiful, beautiful church. What a great privilege yeah. to be there. That's it is, awesome. yeah. Well, we need to pray for our, our African American Catholic brothers and sisters. We do, you know, because people yeah. people don't realize. I mean, it, it is a small, tight knit community, yeah. and yeah. Um, you know, and and I, you know, just to share this really briefly, I had a student who just came into the Catholic Church from Troy, uh, a young black man, and uh, he said, you know, none of my family supports what I'm doing. They don't understand it, and a lot of times in the black community, Catholicism is the white religion. So I said, why don't you come to St. Jude on a Sunday? So he did, and after mass, I, said, I just want to introduce Ethan. I said, would everyone in the congregation who did not grow up Catholic raise your hand? And of course, like 80% of them, <laughs> you know? And I said, I just want you to know that you're not alone, wow. you know? But it's, it's a community that's very, very vibrant, but it's kind of small and a little hidden. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's try and get one email in. We got a little bit of time. Sarah from Omaha writes, I have been part of small independent churches my whole life and have always been taught, even by my pastors, not to trust their testimony, but to search the scriptures for myself and pray to be led into the truth. But I found that's led to lots of confusion and division, and I know I need an authority. But I've spent so long mistrusting authority that I'm scared of pulling, putting my faith in anyone else. How can I be at peace trusting the Catholic Church as a legitimate authority on Scripture? I mean, that's, that's, an, that's an excellent question. Um, the, the thing is, we, we need an authority. Right, uh, we, and ultimately what it comes down to is like, are, are you going to be the arbiter of this or not? It's like G.K. Chesterton said, right? Like, uh, tradition is the democracy of the dead. There are, we stand on the shoulders of intellectual theological giants, right? Yeah. Uh, but also the guarantee the, uh, uh, to the church or the Holy Spirit, right? And I think that's, what, what you have to see is, you know, this, this is not an oppressive authority. The, the authority of the church is set up there to relieve these anxiety headaches you have of trying to be your own pope, <laughs> right? It's like, well, you know, you can go to bed easy tonight because this has been worked out by a magisterium that you, that you can trust. Well, how do I know to trust it? Because it's, it's in the Bible to trust it. Like Jesus set this up, right? So that you can sleep easy at night. You don't have to reinvent the wheels all the time, right? Um, and that's that, that's what I you know that's that's what I would say is that you have to get to a point where it's like you could you could reinvent all the wheels, or you could realize that the 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 church has had a teaching authority since the beginning for this very reason, to settle disputes, even disputes about what the Bible is itself, and I think once you realize that that the Bible didn't float down from heaven but it was compiled that that's the ultimate proof of the authority. If you you already trust in the authority of the Catholic Church if you read this thing at all. Because that's who put it yeah. together. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and a lot of what you've said kind of underlines Newman's statement about becoming deep in history. Uh, he said it, to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant, but it, it, it helps you understand why we Catholics believe this and this and this when you're going Absolutely. back. Absolutely. As you did before Constantine in that little window of time. Yeah. It's a scary place to go back there because it'll lead you uh, to Rome. <laughs> uh, Father, as we close, we've got a, a couple minutes, a couple seconds. 
could you uh, close us with a, a blessing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Lord be with you. Uh, and with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Andrew, thank you so much thank you, for Martin. joining us on the journey home. Our, our prayer is with you as you uh, have that great challenge down uh, in Mo uh, Montgomery. Yeah, right now. it's beautiful. So thank you for joining us. And uh, all of you, thank you for joining us for this program. I do pray that Father Andrew's journey uh, and his vocation is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.